They say that art is in the eye of the beholder, and for the Toreador, this is literally the truth. The degenerates will argue endlessly about the artistic merit of an art piece, a sculpture, or a play. Yet what unites them is that they all share that fascination with beauty. To some, the fluid motions of a well-practiced kata sings as clearly as the Queen of the Night's aria, and to others the complex coding of software can be compared to the intricate needlework of a medieval tapestry. What truly differentiates an exotic dancer from a ballet soloist if they are both equally talented in their chosen form of art? Certainly, some art transcends even taste itself, all Toreador naked and exposed in front of true artistic genius. But then, so are most, kindred and kind alike. Beauty is both a curse and a blessing of their clan. Whether it is the beauty of a perfect romance, the spark of wonder in a newly embraced childer, or an expertly choreographed Elysium, the clan of roses will obsess over it, until it loses their interest. Boredom, banality, and familiarity are the worst enemies to the Toreador, as they may spend decades on a project only to trash it in a fit of anger, turning their attention elsewhere with little care for the broken pieces left behind. Yet art is not the end all for the clan of roses. If it was, they wouldn't have quite so many princes, primogen or archons. Any who underestimate this clan because of its predilections will soon find that they can be quite the skilled fighters, and their talents in swaying the minds of mortals and kindred alike can easily be used to turn a whole room against their aggressors in the blink of an eye, or even convince them to lay down their weapons and join in the worship of their perfection. The Roses understand the kind like few others do, and many look upon them with equal parts envy and fear of the sway they hold over the mortals. The Camarilla would be nothing without the Roses to bring the heart, the soul, and the voice to their sect, and the Sabbat's vast repertoire of rite, codified beliefs, and even fundamental tenets would be found sorely lacking were it not for the anti-tribute. The regent of the Sabbat, their most prominent leader, is, after all, a Toreador herself. But we will begin now, where it always does, with the embrace, and who the roses were before the night made them hers. It is a gross simplification to say that Toreador embrace because of beauty. The right to sire is, in these nights, something earned, and thus very few Toreador would pick their prospective childer based on looks alone. Well, some might, of course. There is often a kernel of truth in these matters, but such sires are either young, stupid, or both. Even so, few clans are so close to the mortal world as the Torador are, and they can be, and often are, swept up in the emotional, passionate, and sometimes foolish games of their prey. The most common cause for a Torador to be embraced is, of course, talent and skill. There is a disproportionate amount of artists within the Clan of the Roses, and while far from all of them have retained their edge once their blood has cooled, quite a few still do. Perhaps their sire saw in them potential for greatness, a seed of exceptionalism that eternity would help flourish. Maybe they wanted to capture them like a photograph, unchanging and eternal, in the midst of their creative fervor. It mattered little how famous they were. In fact, it was probably in their favor that they were fairly unknown. Few Torador embrace celebrities for the obvious reasons. It is difficult to disguise your true nature, and once you have officially left the mortal coil, you might never again be able to showcase your talent to the kind. Many newly turned artists willingly face the sun once this realization hits them, and so the Clan of Roses rarely embrace those who have an addiction to the mortal spotlight. But perhaps their talent lies elsewhere. Maybe their potential sires saw in them the vibrance of youth, the understanding of a world they had long since left behind, and the talent to make others do what was asked of them. Many Toreador embraced the socially skilled, the alert, the conduits of l'esprit de l'époque. They could do this for a myriad of reasons as well. Maybe they felt themselves growing consistently out of touch with the art scene, or perhaps they lacked the willpower and heart to maneuver the courts of the undead. Perhaps the sire found themselves in a position of great power, Yet in a fit of panic, they latched onto the first mortal to show a bit of authority. Perhaps the Childer was a great critic, either of art or of people, and this talent caught the eyes of their sire. After all, someone accustomed to keeping up with trends in these communities, with a sharp wit and a devil-may-care attitude to whom they may insult with their barbed tongue, would make the perfect harpy. 
a Torador who grows tired of the nightly games with her peers, may decide to hand their position over to a young, promising candidate, and they fitted the bill perfectly. Finally, one should of course not dismiss the mistakes. Many Torador find themselves the awkward result of a night of unrestrained passion followed by regret. Others tell stories of how their sires grossly overestimated their talent or importance, only to disown them once they realize the truth. These kindred usually grow embittered and petty, feeling as if they never truly fit in with the other degenerates. Some overcome their failings, or learn to hide it well. Many even pick up night classes in an attempt to improve themselves, to make themselves worthy in the eyes of their sires. But usually it is more productive, and emotionally satisfying, to simply cut the ties. Poaching is not unheard of amongst the Torador, and any unfortunate finding themselves the victim of it will often spend much of their early years being paraded around to mock the kindred who hoped to be their sire. The novelty of this wanes quickly, however, and unless they are exceptionally talented in something that intrigues their sire, they will often be dismissed once they can care for themselves. Torador tend towards a sedentary nature. They often intertwine themselves with local affairs, have many contacts and allies amongst the mortals around them and they often have some sway, or at least acquaintances, amongst the local kindred as well. That is, if they bother to engage in their new social circle. Some Toreadors, like the Artistes, may choose to exclude themselves from Elysium, spending time with their art instead. These are usually the ones who cling to that spark of creativity that will slowly but unavoidably leave them as they grow older and jaded. Even so, there is no unwritten law that all Torador should be social gadflies or prima donnas. Street artists, scholars and wanderers also fit into this clan. It is even said that Torador embraced without an inclination for art would suddenly develop an eye for beauty, sometimes even more refined than their sires. Leaders are likewise common amongst their kind. Many great princes of the Camarilla are Torador, and they often hide a surprising amount of tactical brilliance and leadership for when it is truly needed. Lately, and especially in the new world, the Ventru have claimed dominance in this role. But in the old world, roses like François Villon of Paris, Hanna Bujek of Warsaw, and Smila Grimson of Reykjavik still hold court. Some Ventru laugh at the notion of Torador at the helm of a city, yet in ages past they could easily rival the Bluebloods in the amount of settlements under their sway. To a young Torador, unlife will often be a series of ever-increasing challenges. They are rarely given time to get used to their new existence before they are, figuratively, thrown to the wolves. Sires will often want to show off their newest acquisition, and any Torador fledgling unfamiliar with high society will likely flounder their first impression. They may never live it down if the community's harpies are ruthless enough. Most young Torador then quickly learn to grow a thicker skin, and to always expect the worst from their peers. Every little sneer, every snide remark, every bemused glance plays a vital role in the complex chessboard that is Elysium. Many fold, unable to handle the pressure put on them by creatures far older than themselves. No witty remark is novel enough not to have been heard by these ancients, and they can crush a fledgling verbally like they would an ant under the heels of their Manolo Blahnik. Is it any surprise that those who stay in the waters with the sharks then come across as perhaps a little hostile to other kindred. After all, when you've grown accustomed to walking on glass, a casual remark by a member of the coterie may come off as underhanded criticism. Toreadors who have recently joined a coterie will often find it hard to ease up around their new associates, and they may second-guess their intentions. Contrarywise to the coterie, they might come off as confrontational, dismissive, and catty. On the other hand, once a bond has been built, and the rose feels safe enough to let down their hair, a genuine and warm friendship may develop, and many coteries consider the Torador the heart of the group. They are closer to their emotions than many, and may often help comfort their coterie mates in difficult times. They can also be obsessively protective, valuing deeply the few genuine friends they have, and will stand with them through thick and thin. Even among the Torador themselves, while they may often appear as bitter enemies, Outside threats to their clan will often see them join together. Their clan matters a lot to the Roses. But anyone who betrays the friendship of a Torador has likely earned an enemy for unlife. The harsh social climate of the Camarilla makes these kind of betrayals hurt all so much more, and a wronged Rose will often go to great lengths to humiliate or even destroy those who have wronged them when they finally let their guard down. Generally, the Torador's battlefield is a social arena, 
Not only are they often experienced in these matters, but their vampiric disciplines lend themselves to it easily. Their mastery over aspects allows them to detect even the faintest tremor in a voice, the raised heartbeat of their prey, or the subtle movement as their assailant goes for their weapon. An experienced Torador can communicate with their minds alone, or even take possession of a mortal, using their body as a puppet. Likewise, the Torador's trademark discipline, Presence, can stir emotions both in individuals and crowds, whipping a nightclub into a frenzy, or sending a mortal into catatonic fear that renders them helpless. Elder Torador are known to be able to render an entire audience chamber mute in awe, their crowd unable to look away from or deny the rose whatever they desire. The clan's third discipline is one of their lesser known ones, but it is by no means any less useful. Celerity allows the degenerates to dodge bullets, to move across tightropes and ledges without any problems, or cut their foes down before they even had the time to draw their own weapon. A Torador trained in sword or gunfighting can be deadly indeed, as time seems to slow down to a crawl at their behest. And with the ability to perceive hidden threats through Auspex, one should never underestimate these kindred. And this, of course, doesn't account for the extensive network of mortal and kindred allies, contacts and favors that a Torador can call in should they require it. Still, a Torador will have a hard time keeping up with some of the more martially inclined clans of their sect, or others. With the rare exceptions, they are not built to battle other vampires. Celerity may afford them speed and unerring accuracy, but if caught, they will easily be neutralized. Likewise, a Torador cannot tell a mortal or vampire exactly what to do. They may instill feelings and emotions, but they lack dominate, the staple discipline of the Ventru, meaning they often have to be more creative with their manipulation of others. And while they may lack the raw strength of the Bruja, the tenacity of the Gangrel, or the direct control over others like the Ventru, the Torador have a varied set of skills in their arsenal. But perhaps their biggest strength is how often they are underestimated. Be it from their own sect or from the Sabbat, the Torador are rarely considered a high priority threat. Yet a Rose who has charmed the local police chief to allow them to host nightly parties without police interference may just as easily convince them to send a couple of SWAT trucks to raid the Sabbat's daytime hideout. All roses have thorns after all, and the harder you try to grip them, the more blood they will draw. <laughs>